very much. And if I can have my yeah. slide, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, continuing with the same theme about the uh, the microcirculation, um, I'd just like to uh, make a few uh, comments uh, that um, we've uh, observed over the years. Um, and one is uh, the impact of the actual uh, flow characteristics, uh, pulsatile versus uh, non uh, pulsatile perfusion. Uh, very briefly talk about some of the uh, relatively few uh, clinical outcome studies that have been done uh, and uh, some of its uh, impact of uh, pulsatility on the microcirculation uh, and uh, some of the, uh, the associated uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, and so uh, a number of years ago now, um, we had uh, begun to look at uh, the uh, impact of flow characteristics, uh, primarily on the brain. Um, and uh, these are a couple of uh, papers we did uh, quite a while ago now. Uh, but uh, one was demonstrating that uh, actually uh, by using um, just a, a roller pump and a flow interrupter, uh, we were able to demonstrate uh, using transcranial Doppler uh, that this actually uh, reflected in the, in the, at least in the macro circulation of the brain uh, that we could see um, a, a pulsatile uh, signal uh, through the MCA. Uh, and um, we'd also uh, done a study in which we actually measured uh, cerebral blood flow using xenon radioisotopes and um, oxygen extraction across the brain to actually look at uh, uh, cerebral metabolic rate. Uh, and uh, quite surprisingly uh, found that not only uh, did uh, non-pulsatile perfusion uh, at uh, 28 degrees, this was uh, the, the mild, hy moderate hypothermia days, uh, that that uh, was associated uh, with about a 25% reduction in cerebral blood flow, uh, but that it also uh, impacted uh, cerebral metabolic rate. Uh, and uh, someone uh, in the uh, discussants uh, when I presented those papers uh, suggested that we're actually producing a degree of cerebral atelectasis, which uh, I thought was an interesting concept. Uh, one of the things that uh, came out of uh, one of our studies when we were uh, looking at uh, clinical outcomes on pulsatility uh, was this uh, most uh, remarkable uh, result um, in that uh, there was a significantly lower incidence of uh, 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 compound um, major adverse events in the pulsatile group. Uh, I must say that the study wasn't powered to look at this, so this is a purely an incidental finding, sort of hypothesis generating, uh, but it was very interesting uh, in that um, we did appear uh, to have this uh, significant difference uh, on overall outcomes uh, associated with the use of uh, pulsatile perfusion. Uh, since that time, we've been looking at uh, the microcirculation in various ways, uh, and this is um, a modification of uh, the uh, plethysmography techniques uh, that look at uh, vascular vasoreactivity. Uh, and what this, uh, this device uh, is doing, uh, it ena enables one to produce a calibrated ischemic challenge uh, with the use of uh, a blood pressure cuff uh, and look at uh, changes uh, in the uh, tissue oxygen saturation uh, using uh, conventional uh, NIRS devices. Uh, and uh, there's been a number of uh, studies uh, done in the uh, critical care unit uh, using uh, similar techniques, uh, and it's uh, been able to demonstrate that one of the more sensitive uh, markers has been the slope of the reperfusion um, uh, with the release of the blood pressure cuff, and that's what's been highlighted here, uh, so that the slope of this line uh, is a measure uh, of how uh, readily uh, the microcirculation will uh, return to a vasoconstrictive mode, to a, to a, a more normal autoregulation uh, following this, uh, this ischemic challenge. Uh, and so one can uh, quantify uh, this, uh, this aspect of uh, vasoreactivity. Uh, and we did a, a study uh, uh, several years ago now with um, using this type of approach uh, to patients undergoing a, quote, conventional uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. 
Uh, and what we observed uh, is that there was a, a progressive uh, reduction uh, in the reperfusion slope uh, with the uh, duration of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, implying uh, that there was some uh, impact uh, on the microcirculatory vasoreactivity uh, during conventional uh, laminar flow uh, CPB. Uh, in this study, I think there was only about uh, 40 or 50 patients and it was a relatively small study. Uh, what we observed uh, is that with resumption of pulsatility with uh, separation from bypass, uh, these uh, vasoreactive indices uh, returned towards normal uh, in that there was no significant difference between the pre and post operative operative um, uh, pre and post pump uh, vasoreactivity, uh, but it generated the hypothesis that perhaps uh, this is an indication uh, of changes in the microcirculation that may or may not persist uh, into the, uh, the post-operative uh, period. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Mike O'Neill, uh, is uh, one of our perfusion, uh, uh, perfusionists, is undertaking his PhD. This is one of his uh, 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 studies as a component of that, uh, along with uh, Chris Ellis, uh, who's our uh, regional uh, microcirculatory expert. Uh, and they were using uh, techniques of uh, sublingual microscopy uh, in conjunction uh, with this uh, uh, vascular occlusion test. Uh, and while they're measuring two different components, <laughs> one's looking at uh, the flow characteristics uh, in the uh, sublingual circulation, uh, looking at um, uh, various parameters from uh, uh, capillary density and flow velocities uh, in these uh, various microcirculation uh, in the sublingual uh, regions uh, and uh, looked at the um, uh, also the vascular occlusion test in patients that either underwent a pulsatile bypass with a, a, a flow interrupter roller pump uh, or uh, with uh, conventional laminar uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, and what they showed was that there was, in fact, uh, a similar um, dysfunction uh, of the microcirculation, both uh, when seen uh, with the sublingual microscopy uh, as well as with the vascular occlusion test, uh, implying that uh, the, the, these uh, are both uh, indications uh, that the microcirculation is deranged uh, to some extent uh, during uh, conventional bypass. Uh, one of my other colleagues uh, who had done a, a fellowship with us um, is from uh, Seoul, uh, and then uh, used these techniques, uh, the vascular occlusion test, uh, in a much larger study, 250 patients. Uh, they used a somewhat different paradigm uh, in that they looked at their patients uh, preoperatively before the induction of anesthesia. Uh, they looked at them again using the vascular occlusion test at the end of cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, and then I believe it was 24 to 48 hours postoperatively. Uh, and what they showed uh, was that uh, by the end of uh, surgery, uh, there had been some uh, decrease uh, in the, um, uh, the vasoreactivity of the microcirculation, uh, and that in a majority of patients uh, on uh, 24 hours postoperatively, uh, this had uh, been restored uh, to the baseline conditions. Uh, however, uh, in the patients that uh, demonstrated uh, various types of end organ dysfunction, uh, they also manifested uh, a significant uh, decrease uh, in their uh, vasoreactive uh, indices uh, postoperatively. Uh, so it implied, uh, again, uh, that the, uh, the greater the um, uh, impairment uh, of the microcirculatory uh, vasoreactivity, uh, that this was also associated uh, with this um, uh, increased incidence of um, uh, clinical uh, end organ uh, dysfunction, uh, implying once again that the microcirculation uh, is intimately involved uh, in all of these uh, uh, abnormal conditions uh, that we've, uh, we've observed. Uh, we also did another study in patients uh, that were being admitted to our med surge ICU. So this was an unselected group of patients uh, who met the uh, criterion uh, of our uh, critical care outreach team uh, for admission. Uh, and when we looked at their 
uh, vasoreactivity uh, upon admission uh, that this uh, was an independent marker uh, for mortality. The more deranged uh, their microcirculatory indices, uh, the greater the potential uh, for these patients not to survive uh, their ICU admission. So uh, the implication being uh, that this, uh, again, may be another uh, non-invasive uh, way of assessing uh, the adequacy of our perfusion characteristics uh, during cardiopulmonary bypass uh, and that, uh, again, potentially uh, incorporation of some component of pulsatility uh, may be able to uh, better preserve uh, these uh, microcir microcirculatory flow indices. Uh, so uh, the conclusion being, again, that uh, these abnormal VOTs are associated with increased morbidity mortality, uh, and speaking very directly at actually observing uh, the uh, components of the microcirculation, uh, we'd undertaken a study uh, using a, a modified uh, NIRS device that also incorporates ultrasound uh, and um, takes uh, advantage of uh, what's termed a photoacoustic coupling uh, to enable one to focus uh, the, um, the nears uh, on the actual uh, microcirculation, cortical microcirculatory flow. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, this particular study, we correlated changes in uh, the cerebral um, uh, nears uh, using the photoacoustic coupling uh, with changes in uh, MCA Doppler uh, flow velocity changes and showed that there was quite a good correlation. Um, what was of particular interest to me uh, were two events, uh, one of which uh, on the left side of the screen uh, just shows a patient that had ventricular fibrillation and not surprisingly uh, showed a fall both in the um, uh, flow velocities in the MCA as well as in the microcirculation. Uh, but in another patient in whom uh, we had an open chamber procedure uh, with microgaseous emboli, uh, what we observed, which I believe is the red line, uh, was when we heard a shower of uh, microgaseous emboli, uh, we could see that there was a, a, a reduction uh, in the um, uh, microcirculatory flow uh, that wasn't uh, really uh, manifested in the transcranial Doppler flow velocity, so it wasn't large enough to block MCA flow, uh, but it certainly impacted flow in the microcirculation uh, and then saw a secondary uh, hyperemic response, uh, presumably related to uh, diffusion uh, and dissipation of those, uh, those micro bubbles. Um, so one of the uh, most intriguing things, and uh, again, I know particularly that uh, uh, the group in Thessaloniki will be looking at this, uh, is the impact uh, of uh, the MEAC system uh, on uh, these types of uh, microcirculatory uh, vasoreactivity components uh, because I find it intriguing uh, that uh, in this case, rather than exsanguinating the patient, uh, it's actually the uh, venous capacitance of the patient uh, that acts as, as the reservoir, uh, and this, uh, again, potentially uh, may uh, improve uh, microcirculatory uh, characteristics uh, during bypass uh, through a variety of mechanisms. So thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Thank you very much, John. <coughs> That's an excellent overview again uh, of the techniques and especially the pulsatile and uh, non-pulsatile flow. And that's something that, uh, you know, we've been looking at it for so many years and uh, have been through all the permutations and combinations in minimal as well as standard, but I haven't really got on top of it. So I think that is one wall to crack. Anybody has any? Yes, please. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Okay, yes. just, um, just about uh, pulsatile flow. Uh, whole bypass I conduct uh, in the past uh, was, uh, I, I was using a pulsatile flow. So 90% of the, uh, the bypass conducted was on, on, pulsatil on pulsatility. The reason why I was using pulsatile flow is because I wanted to, to keep a higher oncotic pressure, uh, a better flow uh, with the organs, and uh, and the the what should I say the the sign the, the pulsatile flow was good was uh, the calculation of the diuresis during the, the bypass. However, we have to to take care about uh, the 
pulsativity uh, with an extracorporeal circulation. Uh, we cannot compare with the beating heart, and we have to take care about the compliance first of the uh, circuit bypass. We have to take care about the resistance of the oxygenator as well, the pressure, vason constructibility of the, the vessel, and also uh, to be aware that uh, pulsatile flow create GME. So uh, it's really, really important if you go for this uh, pulsativity uh, techniques to monitor correctly the GME uh, created by the, the pulse. Otherwise, you are created more adverse with the patient versus the benefit you, you, you can get. So that's just a comment about that. And, and, and the future for innovation R&D with the new generation of generators or a bypass circuit should be as well. If we go for pulsatility flow, we have to completely rethinking about the technology of the oxygenators. Yeah. Mm. I think you're absolutely correct, and as you know, the literature is replete uh, with uh, debates back and forth as what is pulsatile flow. Yeah. Uh, as a simple clinician, uh, what we were able to observe is that if my pulse oximeter uh, registers a pulsatile beat, uh, yeah. that that is also reflected in the, in the brain microcirculation. Uh, so independent of the quotes, uh, uh, physiologic uh, compatibility uh, of the characteristics, uh, it does seem uh, as though uh, what we were doing, at least with the roller pump, and I know exactly what you're saying about the compliance of the system. Uh, this was, uh, we had to yeah. you know, pay particular attention uh, to ensuring that the, the pulse wave was actually transmitted. Uh, but uh, simply, uh, it, uh, it always struck me that um, uh, anything we were measuring in the brain uh, was usually also reflected reflected with, with the pulse oximeter. So by whatever means you're producing your pulsatility, if the pulse oximeter is registering a pulsatile beat, uh, the yeah. chances are that at least as far as the brain and presumably the other organs, yeah. uh, this is actually being reflected yeah. in the tissues. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And keep in mind as well that uh, if you measure the uh, impact of uh, pulsatility uh, on, on the finger, for example, uh, you, you have only 3% of the, the activity. So it means that the, the pulse activity should be extremely hard if you want to increase the, the response to the, let's say, in the finger. So I already saw some, some guys using pulse activity. Uh, pulse was 12 liter per minute. Uh, to, to reach uh, a better pulsatility in, in the finger. So it means that we are completely out of the specification of the uh, uh, oxygenators, but also you have to take care of what I said, the balance with the GME uh, generations. Yeah, yeah. No, our, in yeah. our case, yeah. no, we, our, our flow characteristics, yeah, yeah. we looked at that, w weren't any different, so I'm not sure. Um, uh, I, obviously, there's various yeah. techniques. Uh, Hemolysis should yeah. be considered yeah. as well. Yeah, huh? yeah. yeah. yeah so sorry, I would like, uh, I would like to only a few seconds comment. In 2016, we published also our study about using what test during the cardiopulmonary bypass. But the difference is our all cardiopulmonary bypass in this group were pulsatile. And we didn't find any changes in vascular response reaction. Only related, the changes what we found were only related to, to the dilution. It could be very easy, uh, very, uh, very easy explained by dilution effects. That is why I think that our study also very good confirmation of what Dr. Morkin told about the effect of pulse flow. And, and in general, despite of all discussions, the pulse flow which we created or simulated during carbon bypass is still probably a little bit better than so-called continuous flow. Thank you, and I think, uh, Jenny, you have a comment? You were... Yeah, as uh, I want to raise something a little bit completely different, but as a surgeon, I'm not very interested in, in flow because I assume my perfusionist knows what he's doing. Uh, what I'm concerned when I do complex surgery like valve replacement and so on is what it is lodged from the heart I pieces of calcium or perhaps air. What is the view of this group? Because I haven't heard anybody mention CO2. Or do you, do, do you use anything else to prevent big things going to the brain? I, I would like to, yeah. to comment on that. I, I think that 
we are sometimes making a mistake. I fully agree with you, it's a big concern. But what was the answer? The answer was that we had CO2 flooding starting from open chest till we went off bypass. Now, if you keep in mind that if you do that, and there are now, there's a very interesting study showing the carbon dioxide where it is in the thoracic cavity, we create an anoxic area on the blood. If you then start mixing, because you have a, a sucker in there, you actually activate tremendously the blood. They have shown cremation of red blood cells. They have shown even complete apoptosis from platelets. And although I agree there is a benefit for the brain, I think we should also reconsider, should we really give that the whole period of the open chest? Or should we just reduce that to 10 minutes before we are going to close the cavities? It's an open question, but I fully agree what you say. But as a perfusionist, I've seen patients who were fully anticoagulated. They formed clots, probably because of the fact that you ap apoptosis of those platelets inside the sucker blood coming back from the patient. Not always, but depending on the amount of uh, suction you had in there. Philippe, I, I will echo that, and uh, our, our concern has been uh, from a slightly different uh, different focus, uh, but we know that we can completely disrupt cerebral autoregulation trying to handle this massive amount of CO2 that's being uh, added, uh, which will certainly increase delivery of uh, various types of emboli into the brain and all the other organs, uh, and I agree absolutely, as long as the cross clamp is on, uh, all one really needs to do is insufflate CO2 at the very end of the procedure prior to the release of the cross clamp as the heart fills with blood and just make sure that that last, all those micro bubbles are CO2 instead of air. But there's no reason to do it throughout the whole procedure. And I think that's, a, again, a, a, a subtle but important modification of the technique um, towards the end. Thank okay. you. I would like to challenge uh, Dr. Inns on this issue, who's a physiologist. We have extensively discussed on pulsatility with your colleague Heinrich Schima. When so we don't have only pulsatile cardiopulmonary bypass, we have the non-pulsatile circulation in LVAD patients, and his concept was that let's say pulsatility was not uh, that important; it was not mandatory for having end organ protection. So, what is the physiologic view of pulsatility? I know from basic physiology, if I'm wrong, correct me, that flow in the capillaries is not pulsatile as the, uh, as the red blood cells. So what is the physiologic aspect of pulsatility? Does it make any, any, uh, any, yeah, any difference? Any, does it make any effect on tissue perfusion or its dilution and all that uh, issues that Philip has raised? So what is the, physio the physiology of pulsatility? Do we need pulsatile flow? Thank you. I'll uh, keep it short. Uh, we looked at this issue too and we could find no effect. Uh, so um, uh, between pulsatility and non-pulsatility, the microcirculation. So if you look at the physiological effect of pulsatility, what you're <coughs> doing is you're rhythmically changing shear stress. And rhythmically changing shear stress is an important parameter in autoregulation. So shear stress is the key issue when it regards to autoregulation of all organs, which is why hemodilution is such a bad thing. It takes away all the autoregulatory capacity that you have. Having said that, what it does actually is the shear stress goes over into nitric oxide release. So what you're actually getting is a vasodilatory effect when you start to change rhythmically shear stress. Now, being the advocate of the devil, maybe with a bit of nitroglycerin you could get the same thing done. So uh, I think the bets are out. I mean, it's certainly true, of course, that laminar flow pumps are cheaper to make, which is not a trivial issue. And the question is, what exactly benefit are you trying to get by inducing pulsatility. I mean, what, what are you actually clinically hoping to achieve by doing that? So uh, I think the way to do that is in an animal experimental setting, which we can do. So uh, uh, if there's any industry here, we'd be very willing to look into this. Uh, for example, what the effect is of pulsatility on renal oxygenation would be a very interesting question. Uh, and on renal um, uh, arterial flow. So yeah, I can go on about this for a very long time. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, I have a theory which is actually uh, humans were supposed to have non-pulsatile flow, but we just can't live without pulsatile flow. So that's the head-on theory on the other side. Well, continuing, uh, I'll invite Marco now to tell us about microcirculation and meactis. <laughs> 